a Tinker Tank, which I think Colin's actually going to be using today, maybe. We'll see. What's up? I messed up. Start again. Okay. Were we muted? Yes. Oh, I was no. muted. Don't worry about it. Okay, Just cool. <laughs> All right. Hello. Welcome. I don't remember what I said before, but uh, we are live in two minutes now with uh, Colin's Chinese Cuisine live stream. But first, we are going to draw the winners of the Tinker Knife Draw. If you didn't know, we had a few Tinker Knives earlier this month. Uh, people had the chance to enter their name and win the chance to buy the knife of their dreams. And so we're just going to draw names real quick. Uh, we figured we'd do it on the live stream since we're here anyways. So first up, we're going to draw the Barracuda, I think is a good one to start with. This guy's pretty cool. It's a Hanasuki made from Agami Super uh, and so much more, but we're low on time. So we have 212 entries. So we are going to randomly generate a number between... One and 212. Number 75. Okay. So let me, it's going to be real exciting to watch on the internet because I have to scroll through this spreadsheet uh, and then find this person. So hang tight. Uh, but, you know, stay tuned because we are also teaching you a whole bunch about Chinese cuisine today, uh, which is going to be way more exciting than what you're watching right now. Unless you've entered this draw, in which case you're probably at the edge of your seat as I search Shopify for a customer. We're good, Sky? We're not muted anymore? Okay, good. <laughs> there was a setting change. Oh, no. You know, we, we've gone months without technical difficulties on one of our live streams, so we wanted to, you know, do a throwback to the good old days for our, our regular viewers. Uh, okay, well, I don't know this person's name, but based on their email, I think their name is Colin, uh, coincidentally. <laughs> Isn't that fortuitous? Um, so yeah, so Colin, I'm not going to read out the rest of your email because that would dox you, but uh, you win. There's probably more than one Colin that entered, so if your name's Colin, stay tuned. We'll send you an email in the next 10 or 20 minutes um, with the info. I'm just gonna I'm just going to mark this so I don't mess this up later. Okay, the next knife we're going to draw for is the Shibata Tinker Mini Tank. So this guy, we have we a lot of people that entered this draw. Unsurprisingly, I guess, we have 276 entries for the Mini Tank. So we're going to randomly generate a number between one. What did I say, 276? 276. Okay. 122! means nothing if you're watching, but to me, the guy with the spreadsheet, that means that the winner is, oh, Stephen, make sure I'm on the right page here, <laughs> Stephen Ekstrom. Congrats, Stephen. You're a winner, baby. Let's mark your name down here so we don't forget this. Stephen, you have the chance to purchase a Shibata mini tank. Um, we will email you an invoice, so... You don't need to try to go online and buy it because uh, that won't work because they're out of stock. Uh, and then we have 364 entries in the tank draw. Jesus. Yeah, only a few. So, 263. Number 263 is the winner of the tank draw, and that is Jackson Gibbs. Congrats, Jackson. It is not your name, Don Penny. I, if I'm not mistaken, your name is Don Penny, Don Penny. Okay. Well, congrats to you three. We will email you uh, invoices in the next little bit. Um, but we're two minutes over time now. So I'm going to take these beautiful knives out of here, send off those invoices, give this microphone to Sky, and please enjoy the show with Colin. Give him a round of applause. Hey, listen. everyone. My name's Colin. I am the manager at Knifeware Calgary, and today I'm doing a little introduction to some of the basics of Chinese cuisine, using a Chinese-style chef's knife for everything. That's all I'm going to use today. No other knives, although I will probably use more than one Chinese cleaver, which is the most un-Chinese thing you could do. Uh, as you can see, I'm not myself Chinese. Uh, I'm also going to show some stuff about how to use a wok to do some high-heat stir-frying, but I'm going to make a, a few different dishes. 
Uh, basically, I'm going to make a complete meal. A main dish, a couple of sides, and a bowl of rice. Uh, this video will be recorded, it will be posted later. I'll also be writing out all the recipes and posting those as a blog post in case you don't catch them as I'm just kind of like going through it. But uh, maybe a little bit about me to get started. I have not always worked at Knifeware. I used to be an academic and I have a PhD in ethnomusicology. I studied the uh, percussion music that's used to accompany Chinese martial arts and the lion dance, particularly in Toronto. But I also lived in Hong Kong for a while. And uh, I've hung out with a lot of uh, Chinese people. I've eaten a lot of Chinese food. And uh, so I'm very excited to share some of the things that I've learned with the rest of you who are out there. Uh, this is also kind of an ask me anything. So if you have questions about uh, knives or um, Chinese cooking, not that I'm an expert on that, but uh, if you've got any questions, really, you can ask. Sky will be moderating. She'll pass those questions on to me. We've got a couple hours together here. And um, in terms of like how I learned to cook like this, I, I mean, I used to work in some not very good restaurants back in the day, like Western style restaurants. But uh, I've always been interested in Chinese food and Chinese culture. I've been practicing Chinese martial arts for decades. Um, I learned a lot of stuff from my Kung Fu teacher's wife. We used to sometimes have sort of family dinners after class. Uh, my teacher just taught in his apartment. It was kind of low key and I, uh, Trained with him for 10 years. So shout out to Sifu Henry Lo in Toronto who taught me the Sam Nung Wing Chun Kun style of Kung Fu. And uh, also my, my Simo, his wife, uh, Fiona Lo, who taught me a, a ton of good stuff about cooking. Uh, I mean, just eating in a lot of restaurants and trying to recreate these things. Uh, I was married to a Chinese Canadian woman for a while and my ex taught me a bunch of stuff. I learned stuff from my ex-mother-in-law I've uh, read a lot of cookbooks, so, you know, I, I've been around a bit, um, but I've never worked in a Chinese restaurant, so I won't say that I'm actually like a Chinese chef, per se, to be fair. Uh, the dishes that I'm going to make today are uh, based around the main dish, which is a stir-fry that really could be any one meat and any one vegetable. Today, I'm going to do uh, chicken leg and Shanghai bok choy, and uh, I think it's such a, kind of like a general style of cooking, like this kind of one meat, one vegetable in, in Cantonese cuisine, that you just kind of call it that in Cantonese. I think this would probably, if I saw it on a menu, be um, bok choy tao gai, which is just like bok choy, chicken, stir fried. Simple, right? But you could do this with beef, chicken, pork. You could do it with tofu, especially if it was like a firm tofu or like deep fried tofu, which you can just buy at a grocery store. Uh, in terms of ingredients, there's a couple ingredients that, you know, are easy for me to get here in Calgary. But, you know, if you live in a smaller place that doesn't have an Asian grocery store, it might be a little bit harder to get. And I found some substitutions and I'll cover those as I'm going along. The two side dishes are uh, smashed cucumbers, pak tingua, and uh, potato threads, to dao xin. Those are a little bit more uh, Sichuan style, so they're a little spicier. Uh, Cantonese food is characterized by really fresh ingredients, kind of like lighter sauces. Um, it's, it's light, it's fresh, it's um, very diverse. Cantonese people are famous for eating anything with their back to the sun. So, um, you know, uh, you could use snail in this dish if you wanted to. Work away. And the other thing, the main sort of like starch for all of this sort of thing would be steamed white rice, like plain white rice. And when I lived in Hong Kong, I actually learned to eat rice. And I thought I knew how before I lived there. But it, it turns out like, you know, uh, living in the student dormitories at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, you would get this huge bowl. It would be a lot of rice, some vegetables, and a little bit of meat. So uh, when I'm making the stir fry for the main thing, I'm not going to put a ton of meat in it. It's going to be a lot more vegetable based because that's kind of how it was when I was living in Hong Kong. We'll try and keep it like that. Uh, Sky, was there anything else I need to cover before I get into my first thing? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, okay. How many cleavers did you bring? I brought one, two, three, four, five, six cleavers. And I also brought my tinker tank, but it was being a little feisty with me earlier and I put it away. I, I managed to get a tinker tank back before they were as hard to get as they are now. So I feel very lucky for that. And it's not technically a Chinese cleaver. 
it's like the cross between the Japanese version of a Chinese chef's knife and a Japanese bunka. Uh, so if a Japanese, Japanese version of a Chinese chef's knife is a chuka bocho, meaning Chinese kitchen knife, then we like to call the Tinker Tank a chuka bunka, because <laughs> that's kind of what it is. It's really its own thing. So I, I kind of thought better of it. I know there's this draw and congratulations to the winners. You're going to love it. Mine is incredible. Uh, but I think I'm just going to stick to the six Chinese cleavers I brought of the 13 that I own. My collection has kind of gone up and down. It was as much as 14 at one point, dropped back down. You know, I had some prototypes and then had to give them back. Very sad. <laughs> You'll have to stay tuned. Uh, Colin's doing a full like staff collection, knife collection video pretty soon here. And we're hoping to get that out kind of in the next month or so. Um, other than that, our friend Nate F. asked, other than scooping food, what can a cleaver do that a guto can't? Depends on the cleaver. So the first question you need to ask yourself when you're looking into a Chinese style chef's knife is, do you want to cut bones with it? And if so, what is the biggest bone you ever want to cut? A gyuto is the Japanese version of a Western chef's knife. And uh, a lot of you may know this if you're regular viewers, but for those of you who don't, Japanese knives are amazing because they're made from much harder steels than other types of knives. So they're thinner, they're sharper, they stay sharp longer. The trade-off is they're more delicate, they're more brittle. A gyuto is not designed for cutting bones. In fact, I would hesitate to use most gyuto even for uh, going through joints and cartilage on a chicken. I wouldn't use it for butchery at all. I would use a hanasuki for that. That's what they're designed for. Or I would use a Chinese style chef's knife, whether it is one like this, which is from Chanchiki, Tanzike, a good Hong Kong based company, been around for over a hundred years. And uh, we sell some of their knives. This particular one is a civil and military knife. It's sturdy enough that I could chop through raw chicken thighs, raw turkey thighs even, like some pretty decent sized bones. I probably wouldn't cut pork ribs with it unless they were small and cooked. So that's the kind of limit of what this particular one can handle. But let's say I wanted a cleaver and I never want to cut anything bigger than a turkey bone. Maybe I wouldn't get this one. Uh, sorry, anything bigger than like a, du a duck or a chicken bone. Maybe I would get something a little thinner because a thinner knife will cut better on stuff that is dense like potatoes and carrots and that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, a guto, I would say zero bones. In fact, I would kind of stay away from bones with a guto. Like cut near them. If you kind of run into it, you got to come out the way you came in. You got to be pretty careful. But a Chinese cleaver, apart from the scoopage, which is to be fair, awesome. Also has a lot of scraping ability. Also, you can use the back to tenderize meat. That's probably messing with Sky's uh, cameras and stuff, sorry. Um, <laughs> really great for crushing, which you can do with a guto as well, but let's imagine you have like a super thin guto. You gotta be pretty careful crushing stuff. Whereas this, I can literally just smash garlic with it. Maybe I'll do that later, it'll be fun. Uh, so they are versatile, multi-purpose. I'd say the, the big knock against a uh, Chinese cleaver versus something like a guto is that maybe they're not quite as agile. You don't have the pointy tip. So uh, in the guto's favor, if you really like to do detailed, delicate work with the tip, that's really helpful. Or like if you like to do this kind of draw cuts where you put the tip down and reach over, like my hands aren't big enough to do that. And it's kind of awkward to reach around like this. So I use different technique, but some people like the former manager of our Calgary store, Kasumi, shout out to Kasumi, who's awesome and uh, is now the manager of our Toronto store. She loves to put the tip down, grab over top and pull through. And it's really hard to do that with a big knife like this. So both are good. Um, I think overall the Chinese cleaver is a little more versatile, but not quite as uh, agile or finessed perhaps as a guto. Good question. Sweet. Yeah, we got questions rolling in about like beginner cleavers right now. Ah. Uh, should we maybe get started on some prep and I can keep throwing questions at you? Sure. All right, uh, so I would like to disclaimer say, uh, I've never done a cooking live stream before. And typically when I'm cooking, it's you know me hanging out in my kitchen or maybe like some friends hanging out. So I will do my best to prep, cook, and answer all of your questions. Uh, let's get started with the prep side. I am gonna lead with the first cleaver I ever got because uh, it is very fit for purpose. I'm gonna butcher a couple of chicken legs and get those marinating to start here. And maybe Sky has another question for me. Yeah, Did you bring rice or are you cooking our rice here? There's rice in the Instant Pot. Uh, Nathan's oh. going to get the rice started. Of course, oh. he's going to give it a good rinse because you never want to cook rice without rinsing it. I was totally going to do that. Yeah, and we've got this awesome <laughs> rice rinser, which Nathan will bring over, my beautiful assistant. 
really handy. It's got a tilted bottom on it, so you can put stuff in and then uh, so you put the rice in and then tilt it like this and it'll drain and then when it's done it kind of falls back which is a really cool feature. You gotta rinse your rice before you cook it because then it uh, keeps better and it tastes better as well. Like it lasts longer. Yeah, my, uh, my Instant Pot is well used and <laughs> that's what Nathan's gonna use. So after he rinses it, he's gonna do uh, three cups of water in there because there's three cups of rice and the Instant Pot has a rice setting. So all you gotta do is Great. close the lid and hit rice and that's good because I've never up. used an Instant Pot before. It's so, so simple. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, equal parts rice and water. Hit play. Uh, this, hit play. <laughs> can I just say this rice smells a hell of a lot better than any bag of rice I've ever bought. Why? Uh, it is like Rooster brand it. jasmine rice and it probably smells so good because I got a smoking good deal on it. <laughs> and I'm a firm believer <laughs> that if you can get a deal on rice, it tastes better. Even if you don't know that you got the deal, it's still Even if you don't know, you could smell the value. <laughs> it smells phenomenal. Okay. Am I right? Thanks, Cole. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. You know, uh, my that Kung Fu really teacher's wife, that. who I was shouting out earlier, my Simo, uh, she found out that I was cooking rice in a pot. And she said, you poor child, this is not the third world. And she <laughs> gave me one of her three rice cookers. Oh my God. God love her. And I've, I've never looked back. I can cook rice in a pot. And uh, our coworker, Kyle, shout out to Kyle. He is a, a master of cooking rice in the pot. But I don't do that anymore. I, uh, I have discovered the joy of the Instant Pot or the rice cooker, which just does it perfectly every time. And you don't need to watch it. Make sure you rinse it though. Always rinse your rice. All right, so I got a chicken leg here. I am gonna bone this baby out and uh, slice it up and get it marinating. So I'm going to take off some of the skin. For those of you who've never butchered a chicken leg before, this is a little bit of a tutorial, not, not like a deep dive or anything. And I'm gonna look for the fat lines. So there's these lines of fat that show where the bone is. And I'm just gonna do a cut along there. And I was uh, honing my knives at work before I came here and realized this one hadn't been sharpened in three years and decided that maybe I should tune it up and whoo, that, uh, that is a sharp knife. She's fighting. Yeah. Let's so I'm- my uh, dad's on the stream. Hi, dad. <laughs> your dad's on the screen? Yeah. Hey, Scott. What to go on? He Scott liked... actually took my uh, Cut Like a Chef class. Oh yeah. Lovely guy. <laughs> All right, um, let's see. Nate F was wondering about a sheath for his cleaver because I think he wants one that goes over the whole blade oh, as yeah. well as just the edge, which is a little tricky to find. I'll give mm. you that. A little tricky to find, yeah. I have seen some people with like nice custom made leather ones, if you know a leather worker. Uh, I've also bought one of those and put my cleaver in and my cleaver promptly cut through the leather because it wasn't very well designed. <laughs> uh, and maybe people aren't used to really sharp knives, uh, but so it's something to watch out for. I keep mine on wooden magnetic blocks like those ones, uh, or I put it in a, a plastic sheath and wrap an elastic around it. Um, like one of these sheaths. It covers the edge, it doesn't cover the whole cleaver. I haven't really seen any of our suppliers providing like a wooden saya for cleavers. Yeah, like there's so many different sizes, it would just be so yeah. hard to get all those like manufactured right to fit, right? This is kind of a problem. Yeah. Another option might be just put it in a plastic blade guard, but then put it in a knife roll, right? Like uh, Knifeware has these kind of canvas knife rolls which would hold any of the cleavers that I have here today and would really wrap it up quite nicely. And uh, so I, back to my chicken leg here, I've kind of cut out around the bone and now it's still kind of connected on one side, I've cut through. And uh, I'm gonna show you how to cut through a bone properly with a cleaver. We wanna have a hammer grip. So I'm gonna hook my thumb in on that little nub there and hold it like a hammer. This tapers really nicely and it's thicker at the back and thinner at the tip. So I'm gonna aim my chopping in the bottom third there and uh, make sure my hand is nice and clear. <laughs> Ooh, that stuck uh, right in the board, but you know, clean cut, no bone <laughs> shards, we're good. And now I can continue kind of cleaning the meat off of this baby. Equal parts rice and water, right? Equal parts, yeah. No Three cups of water, no salt. Uh, Nate is asking, how do you get height on the chopping motion without coming down on your guiding knuckle? Uh, so if you want more height, pick your hands up higher. Like if you are, I see lots of people, they do a claw and they're really like cut down like this or something. So like if you want height, 
get it up higher like that. And like, I mean, if you're cutting a big thing, if you're cutting cabbage, your hand is up here, right? So, but always, you're right, you want to keep contact. You can't really go higher than where that bottom knuckle is, but it helps if it's up high like this and not folded over like that. I have seen some people do almost like a, like a really high knuckle like this. So you can lift your index finger up higher. That can help as well. Excellent. Um, Todd is asking, uh, I rinse all rice but basmati. Does Colin rinse basmati? I do. I rinse all rice unless yeah. it's like, um, like a parboiled rice, which has mm -hmm. kind of already been half cooked. Uh, it's funny, that's kind of what I grew up with, like Uncle Ben's, that's what my mom used to cook all the time. And then later we got into basmati and jasmine and uh, you know more fragrant rices, which is mostly what I use now. Our friend Sammy says Cleaver Daddy is on fleek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, shout out, I got lots of shout outs today. Shout out to Tara Boreen, my barber at uh, Cannibal in the Kent of Inglewood store, our other store at Kent of Inglewood. Uh, is right next door to Knifeware in Calgary here. And uh, there's a barber shop in the back and Tara gave me an awesome haircut yesterday just to get me ready for the live stream. So thank you, Sammy. Good. Thank you, Tara. I, uh, today, I'm not doing anything fancy with my cutting. In fact, I am purposefully doing things in like a really kind of more basic home style fashion. Like if you've seen some of my other videos uh, where Sky and Nathan challenged me to reproduce the skills of a Chinese chef and I'm cutting decorative X's into things or cutting garlic blindfolded. I'm not doing any of that today. I'm, this is like straight home style. Also notice I've adjusted my grip, right? Now I'm like slicing, dicing. I got the peace sign going. This is a big cleaver. The balance is way out there. And although I might be able to almost reach it with one finger, I get a lot more control with two fingers. It allows me to really choke up on it. You did do shockingly well on all those challenges, though. Like yeah, check the, out the video, folks. The lattice fence cut that you did just perfectly second try. <laughs> so good. Okay, so I got my uh, chicken leg here. And I'll probably take off the skin. There's some, like, kind of connective tissue in there. And I'm going to trim a little bit of that out and then just kind of press down on it with the top of the cleaver and pull away at the skin. Our buddy Nate here is asking, uh, if carbon steel is reactive to water, then how do you take it to a whetstone for 20 minutes without it rusting? It is reactive to water, but uh, in the experiments that we've done, it's not necessarily like sitting in water that makes it rust quickly. It's water drying on it. It's the oxidization reaction. And so, you know, there's oxygen in the air and as the water dries, that causes it to rust more quickly. So uh, I was sharpening this knife today because it needed a little touch up and it didn't take me very long. It was like five minutes, but I just kind of kept going and I, the water is moving on it and uh, no rust. Also though, this has a pretty good patina, so that can help as well. Sky has a whole video on forcing patinas. But, um, you know, this is a big old hunk of steel. I found that I was, um, I'm not really concentrating on my cutting here. It's like, this is going to be a very <laughs> slow prep session. I can tell already. Um, I found that this was really reactive because there's no cladding. There was no lacquer. This is like an older one. The new civil and military knife actually has lacquer on it that kind of protects it from rust. And so I soaked this blade in instant coffee for 36 hours. And that really helped to uh, make it less reactive. It doesn't stain onions the way it used to. And, you know, when I was sharpening it, not a problem. But yeah, uh, if you're worried about that as you're sharpening, you know, maybe in between stones, just wipe the knife off. Now, whoever butchered this before me and took it off the chicken left a couple little bone shards. I'm going to pull those aside. As I'm feeling up the skin, I'm like, oh, that's a, that's a bone shard, isn't it? We don't want that in our food. It's a little, a little surprise bite. Yeah. Everyone loves a surprise Whoever bite. Whoever gets it wins <laughs> uh, a bleeding throat. Yum. My favorite. <laughs> you need to pretend you have consumption in cups as well. Can I lob some more questions at you? Or yeah, you, you please. Need to focus. All right. Um, let's see. 
This is a little bit unrelated, but while we're kind of doing some butchery stuff anyways, uh, what's your opinion on using a day buff for fish filleting versus a Western style fillet knife and a German knife for bones? Mm. Uh, okay, so specifically for filleting, I like a Deba because I can take off heads and tails and I can do some of that kind of like heavier work with it. And the flexible one, I've seen people who are really good with one. And, you know, if you grew up with one like that, then by all means, get the Japanese version of it because it'll stay sharp longer. I think this is like the kind of big complaint against um, the kind of more traditional filleting knife is they're great, but they don't hold their edge very well. And you're constantly having to stop and hone it. So, you know, if you've got something like uh, the Kasumi boning knife that Knifeware sells, which is good steel, it'll hold an edge really well. You don't have to hone it constantly. Um, you could use that for filleting, it's pretty flexible. We also just got some new Glestain knives and some of those are pretty flexible as well. Uh, so no knock against them. Like I prefer a Deba. Uh, I don't eat a lot of fish. I don't fill it a lot of fish personally. I eat a lot more chicken and pork and beef. So um, yeah, I, I think it's personal preference, but the Deba just a little bit more versatile in terms of what you can do with it and cutting through some bigger bones like you can cut through the spine of a decent sized fish with your deba and it might be pretty hard to do that with a flexible filleting knife uh using a western style chef's knife you can i mean like west if you got it like a good old woost off that's going to be pretty versatile and you can definitely cut through fish bones with it uh, but again you get into that problem of it's not as sharp and um what i really like with a deba it's single bevel, right? So it doesn't cut straight. It will kind of pull away as you're going. So if you put the bevel side down and you put that on the spine of the fish, it pulls away from the spine as you're cutting. So a flexible filleting knife allows you to bend the knife and you bend the knife around the thing that you're cutting. With a Deba, it doesn't cut straight, it curves. So you bend the cut around the thing that you're cutting. Both are good. Ooh. Our uh, longtime viewer, Spoon Monkey, is asking a bunch of choil questions. Mm, <laughs> I'm all flavor. about that choil. <laughs> uh, he's asking for a choil shot, which uh, up until now hasn't been possible on live streams. But uh, you know what? For our good buddy, maybe. We've got the, hold on. Can we see that? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, my friend. Hopefully you can see that. Cool. Yeah. And it's worth looking the other way as well because it's quite a bit thinner at the front than it is at the back. And by quite a bit, I'm ta I mean like half a millimeter or a millimeter, but that's like how it goes with knives, right? That is enough to make quite a difference. Awesome. Uh, he's also asking, uh, what angle and grit did you sharpen it at? This one just needed a little touch up. So I just put it on a Chosera 2000. That's actually one of my favorite finishing stones. I feel like if you have a high-end German knife, like, you know, uh, Henkel's Pro, where they do harden their steel a little bit more than kind of their basic lines. If you have a Chinese chef's knife, even if you're like a line cook in a restaurant and you have Algami Super, whatever, you know, really good Japanese knives, the 2000 is like toothy enough that it'll bite into a tomato, polished enough that it's nice for slicing meat. And uh, it's uh, kind of like a good touch up stone. If your knives aren't too dull, it will allow you to put an edge back on without having to go down to a coarser stone. And in terms of angle, I did a 20 degree at the back and I tapered it to 15 degrees at the front because this is a true dual purpose knife. Civil and military, manmo do. Uh, like a civil and military knife, means that you can do rough jobs, like you saw me chop through some bone, you can do some fine jobs, like you can fine mince garlic with this, and it's helpful if you sharpen it like that. When you buy a civil and military knife like this, they're sharpened 20 degrees all the way across, so that's a, a bit of a modification that I've made to it, and it's really helpful for doing those kind of like finer uh, slices or detail work more towards the, the front of the knife. Okay, so I've got my chicken all together here, and I am gonna save the bones because that's good for making stock. And in fact, uh, something I like to do is uh, save up bones and put them in the freezer. Before I do, I chop through the bones because getting the marrow out of your chicken bone makes your stock richer. It's not gonna make it as clear. If you want consomme, maybe don't do that. 
but it does uh, add some richness and, and maybe some umami to the stock. So I usually chop it up before I put it in the freezer and that way I can put frozen bones right into the stock pot. So just all chopped up, scooped up, save that for later. I'm gonna be using some stock that I made. This is uh, a you know, nice rich stock that has bones like that that I just kind of like had left over. And I'm gonna marinate this. I think uh, I'm now done with the civil and military knife and the Hasegawa board. So my beautiful assistant, Nathan, will come and take this away for me. Oh, beautiful. This is, this is luxurious. <laughs> I've never had anyone do that for me. Thanks, Nathan. And I'm just gonna wash the chicken off my hand here. I have a little pot. Uh, in the meantime, Sky will entertain you by singing a song oh, or will something. I? <laughs> Give me one second. Um, we're getting lots of requests for more bone shopping. Um, uh, oh, I also wanted to um, draw attention to like how, not only the scoopage that Colin is using here, but like how he uses the top end of his knife as well to move things around the board, which is a really handy way to to utilize all that extra space when you're using a Chinese cleaver. Uh, also, Nathan, you're getting a lot of uh, fan comments from a Tyler L about your shirt. <laughs> Tell him I want to go for a drink sometime. Okay, Tyler L. Nathan wants to go for a drink. Dark soy sauce, good for marinating. It adds a lot of color. The flavor is a little bit richer uh, and it's a little extra salty. You don't need a lot. If you, for some reason, couldn't find dark soy sauce at your local grocery store, grocery store, okay, uh, totally fine to just use regular soy sauce, but for marinating, I prefer dark. And I am using um, siu jiao, which is like Chinese cooking wine. It's kind of like a darker cooking wine. I got this at Superstore. So like not exactly a, a specialty ingredient. But again, if your local store doesn't have it, you can substitute a dry sherry. That works really well also. How do you pronounce this? Uh, it's siu jiao, I think, like cooking wine. Siu jiao? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, they've got it in, in Mandarin. My Mandarin is really terrible. I apologize. Oh. <laughs> I uh, learned Mandarin in university and it was very handy when I was traveling in Shanghai because People there speak Shanghainese, and so we had Mandarin as a common language, right? Mandarin is the official national language in China. And so everyone in China is kind of like meant to speak it, but there's lots of other languages. In fact, you know, it's kind of funny, like um, we're billing this as an introduction to Chinese cuisine. China is a big country with a long history, and there are 56 ethnic groups there, the largest of which is the Han Chinese. But even within the Han Chinese ethnic group, you have huge variations in cuisine between Sichuan and Canton and like, um, you know, Northeast. Uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in China. So like there's no way that I'm actually going to introduce Chinese cuisine as, as a whole. I said earlier that the, uh, the kind of staple starch is rice. Well, that might be true in southern China, not so much in the north. In the north, the staple would be wheat. And so people eat a lot more noodles and buns and dumplings and stuff and a lot less rice. All right. So I've got my chicken marinating there. I'm going to give that a bit of time. That's why I like to do that first. I like to get my rice going and then the, uh, the rice cooker will just keep that warm until we're ready to eat it. I like to cut up my chicken so that it can marinate. And now I'm going to get on to some of the side dishes. Uh, I am going to start with the potatoes. So potato threads, the idea is that you're meant to cut them as fine as silk. And I'm not going to be that fancy. Like I said, we're doing kind of more home style today. I've got my handy dandy Kuhn peeler, which is a carbon steel peeler, uh, Swiss design. They just seem to stay sharp forever. I've had this one for four years. I use it a lot. Do not put it in the dishwasher. It will rust. Yeah, I've wrecked two of these by now. But Put the third the one's dishwasher. been around for like a year and a half now, so yeah. all good. If you have little eyes, there's an eye puller, which is pretty handy. <laughs> I didn't know that. You didn't know that was an eye puller? <laughs> I that was for hanging it. <laughs> Every day is a learning day. That's what I like to say. Sky uh, just learned a thing. We have so many questions. Um, okay, we're... Do you want a mandolin? Those ones are pretty fine. A mandolin? Wash your mouth out with soap, <laughs> young man! What is this blasphemy? How Dare you! All, right. All cleaver. Can I wash my mouth out with beer? You can wash your mouth out with beer. In fact, this is like quite a compromise that I'm even using a peeler and not doing this in my hand with a huge cleaver. Can you turn with a cleaver? 
You can. I've done it. I've peeled things in my hand with a cleaver. <laughs> uh, but this peeler is just so good, and it's just like so easy. And I know mandolins are good and easy, but I enjoy fine slicing things with a cleaver. It's like a pleasure. Okay, while we're on topic, uh, Ben is asking, what's the best, safest way to wash these peelers? Just soap and water and dry right away, just like any carbon steel Yep, thing. soap, water, dry right away. Uh, you gotta be a little bit careful because, you know, that's a blade, so when yeah. you're wiping it, you don't press down too much. Make sure you got like a thicker towel when you're cleaning it off. But I haven't had any problems, really in terms of it like cutting up my towels because like the edge is kind of pointing this way. So as long as, you know, you're rubbing along the edge, ooh, there's me touching the edge back and forth, it's okay. Um, our friend Kevin Dang is asking, uh, have you ever rehandled a CCK cleaver? Uh, I know the tr handle is traditional, but it seems like a wah handle would be cool. Okay, uh, good question because we have a cleaver, uh, a CCK, one of the ones that we sell, and the handle cracked. And so I am actually in the process of doing that. I've seen it done. It, uh, it has on the CCKs, let me grab my mulberry knife here. The CCKs have a through tang. It's, a, it's like partially hidden inside the barrel handle, but the rat tail comes out the bottom and gets folded over. So uh, if you can get in there and like straighten that out, cool. If not, you can just like take a hacksaw and cut it off. Uh, if the handle's damaged, you know, you can take it off with a chisel or whatever, because you're not trying to preserve it. So I'm gonna try it. I'm not sure how thick the tang is. It might need to get belt sanded to fit inside of a wah handle. Can you all see the way that that is folded over on the stream? Can hold it a little closer? It's on manual focus, so you'll need to pull the focus yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's doable. Uh, like, I've rehandled lots of Japanese knives, lots of wah handles, and uh, we haven't been able to source replacement Chinese style handles, like the barrel handles, yet. So, I'm going to try. I'm going to try putting a wah handle on it. I've seen it done. Uh, to Todd March, uh, he was wondering if we could recommend a Chukaboto as thin and agile as the CCK 1912, which is the little stainless steel one. I would say that mulberry knife is even a little bit. The mulberry thinner. knife is thinner. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're looking for the lightest, thinnest, most agile Chinese cleaver you can find, the CCK mulberry knife is very, very thin. Yeah, it's super thin. Super thin. Very nice. It's gorgeous. I mean, the CCKs aren't going to hold an edge like the Japanese Chukabocho, but also, if you want thin, I have never seen a thinner cleaver than that one. It's awesome. <laughs> Kevin wants pics or it didn't happen. Um, pics of the, of the rehandle? Yeah, I think Yeah, so. okay, so I'm working on a project. I can't reveal too many details, but I used to make knives back in the day, and now I've got all of the tools at Knifework Calgary to do some like pretty crazy repairs which would allow me to do some like bar stock removal kind of stuff. And I'm planning on customizing this CCK, not only changing the handle, but also doing some other stuff to it. I'm not going to say anything until I give it a try because I don't know how it's going to go. But uh, if my evil plan works, it could maybe be a prototype knife. If we could find a black, this is like, we're talking years, so don't hold your breath. But if we could find someone in, black, in Japan to forge a uh, knife that's going to be to the specs that I'm going to customize this CCK to, watch yourself. Yeah, in fact, you better brace yourself. <laughs> um, Nate is asking, which was more difficult, getting your PhD or getting through high school? <laughs> huh. uh, getting my PhD. I, I found high school was not that difficult, really. It was a lot of work. Like, I worked like a dog in high school. There's a lot of memorization and lots of different classes and um, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I, my PhD took eight years. I had to learn Cantonese and Mandarin. I had to write comprehensive exams, take classes. I did field research in Hong Kong for a year. I got my ribs broken. I got my nose broken. I mean, like, this is some pretty intense research, all <laughs> right? My PhD kicked the hell out of you. Oh, man, <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> um... Teresa is asking, is there any kind of cheese that's part of Chinese cuisine? That's interesting. That's yeah, question. so uh, like dairy cheese was not really a thing in Chinese cuisine as far as I know. It does get used in some stuff now because there's 
been a lot of exchange between East and West for, for many years. But there are some things in Chinese cuisine that are kind of like cheese. Like, uh, if you've ever found like stinky tofu or fermented tofu, uh, it can have some like kind of blue cheese vibes. Uh, but I haven't really seen a lot of like very traditional Chinese cooking that has dairy in it. It tends to be dairy free. At least, uh, you know, in the regions that I have encountered, going back to what I was saying before about the many different regions, perhaps in uh, the Muslim areas, like in the west of China, uh, who knows, maybe they might actually use more dairy. That's not kind of uh, an area that I'm as familiar with. I'm going to start making some potato threads here. And to do that, I think I would like a really nice thin knife. So I'm going to use the mulberry knife for this one. Wait, earlier on in the stream, uh, let me see if I can find this question here, but thank you. Jennifer was asking, uh, what's a good beginner cleaver? Uh, she uses her nakiri for veggie prep, and why would one include a cleaver? Uh, cleavers tend to be a bit more versatile, if only because of the length, even if you're just cutting vegetables. If you're cutting up a big vegetable like a cabbage or a squash, it can be a little awkward with the nakiri. I like to say your knife should be bigger than the thing you're cutting. Otherwise, you end up having to manipulate it in some awkward ways. So a little bit more versatility in that sense. But also, uh, the profile of a cleaver is different than a nakiri. Nakiri are flat at the back and a little bit of a curve at the front, typically, uh, just so the tip doesn't stick in the board. And then cleavers are flat in the middle with kind of this smile-shaped profile. And so they are symmetrical in their edge, and that makes it good for slicing meat. You still have this nice corner rather than a rounded front. Uh, if you're looking for like a good starter cleaver, look into one of the CCKs. I think those are a great way to go. If you like carbon steel and you want it thin, you don't need to cut any bones, you can't go wrong with the mulberry knife. These things just cut so good. If you want something with a bit more edge retention, but you still are kind of like, oh, I just want to try out a cleaver. I don't want to like jump in too deep yet. You get something like the Sakai Takeyuki Inox, uh, which holds an edge better than a CCK. It's not quite as thin as the mulberry knife, so it's a little bit more robust in a way. I've used this for not like cutting bones, but like light butchery, where I'm going through the joints of a chicken or something like that. Uh, that's also a really good starter cleaver. And this one's fully stainless. The mulberry knife is carbon, so it can rust. Uh, the CCK Small Slicer is stainless and it's ever so slightly thicker than the mulberry knife, but if you did want a stainless CCK, the CCKs are uh, under 200 Canadian. So that's you know a pretty easy way to start. If you're like really, really hesitant and you know you can get your hands on a Tojiro Wan Hute, it's, a, it's for the cleaver clear, curious. You know, someone who's not <laughs> ready to really buy a cleaver, but kind of wants to try it, they're under hundred bucks. They're a little thick, they're a little small, uh, I'd like two of them because I would like to have one in each hand for mincing meat. That's what I would use it for because I've got a, a bunch of other bigger um, cleavers that I think cut better than that. But I've played around with it. One of my coworkers has one and uh, I've used it. They're good. And if you know that you that cleavers are something you'd like to play with, I'd say skip over the one Hute and jump into yeah either one of the CCKs or maybe something like that. Um, Tojiro, no. Sakai Takeyuki Inox. Mm. Yeah. I like that one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've seen me, if you watch some of my other videos, do these like kind of like fancy cuts and put it all out. I promise I'm doing more like home style today. So we're just going to go right through it like this. I'm not going to be too precious about it. Now, as I'm getting towards there, I am kind of running out of room a little bit. I do like to kind of stack up my folds because it makes it easier to cut it afterwards. So, you know, take a minute, set yourself up for success. Make my little stack here. And, uh, you know, Knife 101, it's really bad to scrape your edge on the cutting board. And people sometimes know this for moving food around, right? Like with a cleaver, you can just use the top of the knife or you can use the back. But sometimes people forget when they're trying to line up a stack of things or some veggies and they'll scrape the edge towards the thing. Don't do that. Put your edge down 
and uh, maybe I'll turn this way so you, you all can see. Put your edge down and then move the food towards the knife. That way you're not scraping the edge on the board. Scraping the edge on the board just really dulls it out quickly. It's not a great choice. Okay, now let's try and get some threads. Yeah, it's pretty thin. It's like a little thinner than a matchstick. That's what kind of what we're going for here. Maybe if I did it with a mandolin, it would be more even, but it wouldn't be near as much fun. Um, we've got a little question here. How okay. do you deal with sticking on a cleaver when it comes to chopping small things with such a large blade, which is kind of what we're doing right now? Uh, yeah, I love the sticking. Look at that. It like holds on to it so that then I can move it over somewhere really conveniently. Uh, I don't find sticking to be that much of a problem with uh, CCK. It's got this grind on it where it's ground this way and it's ground that way. So it is ever so slightly S ground and it's got quite a bit of texture. So stuff doesn't stick to it too bad. But like you saw me as I'm cutting, right? It kind of, it sticks and then I don't worry about it because it's so tall it can go up a long way before it falls over. If it really bothers you, you know, uh, put your name on the list and try and get a Takeda when they come in because this thing has incredible food separation. Uh, they're kind of hard to get. We don't get them very often. You might be waiting for a long time. I waited a very long time for mine and customers had to go first. I was so nervous. I was like, oh, they're going to sell out before I get a chance to buy it. Please, <laughs> please, Cleaver Gods, let me have a Takeda. But this is like really S ground. It's got great food separation and it's got like... Um, I don't know if you can see, it's got quite a bit of hammering there. If you want something that has both crazy food release, so stuff doesn't stick to it very much, and really good food separation, meaning stuff gets pushed off, we got these glass stain knives now. They're more right-handed. These are uh, very popular with professional chefs in Japan and also in some places in North America. We carry them now. Uh, it's really new to us. And you see those dimples on it? Like they're on top and bottom, it creates air pockets so stuff doesn't stick too much. But also it is a kind of a single bevel knife. So like it's got more of the bevel on this side and kind of flatter on that side, which really helps to push food off as you're cutting. That's a, a double whammy. When uh, Owen, shout out to Owen in Vancouver, the manager. Oh, I can use this one, really? Yeah, give her. Nathan, you're just full of heresy today. My <laughs> Chinese Cleaver live stream, and here I am using a Gyuto, but like, okay, I'm kind of excited. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, all right. Can you, there... can you see the way like it's pushed off? Yeah. That's what I call yeah. food separation, right? And also in terms of sticking, it doesn't stick very much because it's got those big old Grantons on it. Oh yeah, look at it push off. Wow. That is cool. That's really cool. Nice. Do they make a Chinese cleaver? <laughs> we should find out. <laughs> if, if they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Naoto, may I have a glestain chukabocho, please? <laughs> Naoto? You know the best way to stop food from sticking to your knife? How? Like and subscribe to Knife War on YouTube. Ha! <laughs> yeah, if you like and subscribe, you will get 27% less sticking on YouTube. If you also follow on Instagram, you get like a bonus. You get 35% less stiction. It's incredible. Stiction. <laughs> um, our buddy Tack here is wondering, which Chukabocho would you say is closest to the specs of the CCK Mulberry? Because uh, he has one and loves it, but he yeah. wants a Japanese version. Ooh. For some reason, a lot of... Chukabocho seem to be a little bit thicker. It's, um, I'm not sure why, but like all the ones that I've had a chance to play with are uh, a little thicker than what you get with the mulberry knife. Probably because the steel is really hard and they need a little more meat on it. Um, but the Makusta, the Makusta Chukabocho is really pretty thin. It's one of the thinner ones. That's definitely worth checking out. I got to try one when it was still a prototype and um, the president of Makusta came to visit and he was like, hey, do you want to try the cleaver? I'm like, yes, I want to try the cleaver. Let me try the cleaver. And I was really impressed with the way that it cut. It's pretty thin. Uh, but, you know, Takeda, not as, not quite as thin all the way up. Like the spine of the Takeda is a lot thicker 
than it is on the mulberry knife, but it's pretty thin behind the edge. Like lots of chukabocho are thinner behind the edge than the mulberry knife. They're just not thin all the way up. So it kind of like depends on what you're cutting, right? As far as how much you'll notice that thickness or thinness. I'm really not cutting very fast. I know Nathan had like a bit of a schedule. I'm going to have to kind of speed up here. No, you're still, you got, you got 15 more minutes to make potato threads. Oh yeah. Fighty la. It's, it's also not a strict schedule. We're going through a lot of the questions as we go. So. Good. Oh, our friend Chris Lord says Glustane makes a cleaver. They make a cleaver? No, no. Googling that right now. Oh! Does it have the big dimples yeah, on it? it yeah, it's got two full rows it's of them. It's sick. What? Wait, hold okay, on. Okay, I see need if I can, like, one. I'm going to see if I can put this in the stream. <laughs> no, don't get me so angry. We're just creating demand. <laughs> now Tell ordered, like, almost the whole line of this, yeah. except for the cleaver. Is he trying to spite me? I, for sure. <laughs> I mean... Nauto has been very understanding. He's been instrumental in us carrying a wider range of cleavers. So shout out to Nauto for all the work that he has done to bring these big, beautiful knives to the masses. But there you go. cleaver? <laughs> Here's the Glastain cleaver. A knife we don't sell. <laughs> Yet. Yet, yeah. Like and subscribe to... Pressure now. <laughs> email now. No, I'm kidding. Don't email now, please. No, no, the poor guy. He's so angry when I give out his emails now. He's a very busy man. Email tv at knifer.com if you want to pre order a glass stain cleaver. And then if we get it up, we'll. Um, I've got another quick question here. Um, in your experience, what are some of the best pescatarian Chinese dishes I can look up? No deep frying. Uh, Szechuan style boiled fish has been his favorite so far. Mm. I think my favorite pescatarian dish of all time is a Cantonese style steamed fish. You got to get a whole fish and you got to get it fresh. So if you go somewhere where they have a fish tank, you pick out your fish, you get your fishmonger to kill it for you, you take it home, you cook it straight away. Uh, you know, take the scales off. but. Uh, wash it out really well and, uh, you know, make sure it's gutted properly, but then you stuff the inside with ginger and green onions. Yeah. And then you put a bunch of ginger and green onions on the outside as well. And you, uh, you need kind of like a deeper, wider dish and you put like a, like a trivet in the bottom of a wok and then you put the dish with the fish in the wok and then uh, water in the bottom, put the lid on and you steam the whole fish. And then you take out the ginger and green onions, you put more ginger and green onions on top, you heat up oil and you drizzle that over so all the aromatics just like sizzle and pop. And then you dress it with uh, sugar and soy sauce and a little bit of sesame oil. <sighs> Tune in next week when Colin teaches us how to make that. <laughs> it is so good. <laughs> and like the fish cheeks, that's got to be the best part of it. But the fish belly is pretty good. It's great. It's really, really good. That's probably my favorite. What I'm hearing is we need to have Colin back every week to make us dinner. <laughs> yeah, Sky and Nathan are hopefully yeah. going to get to try some of this food if I ever get it cooked. <laughs> You're doing great, Colin. Uh, we got a comment about uh, you using a push cut. Uh, what about chopping straight up and down? So this knife is sharp, right? But Here's me touching the edge. And I'm not getting cut. If I slide on my finger, I'm going to cut myself. And I'm not going to demonstrate that because I don't want to get cut. And so if I'm just cutting straight up and down, I'm not really using the sharpness of the knife. I'm using force. And so I don't. I have super sharp knives, and I like to let the weight of the knife do the work for me. It's part of the joy of having really sharp knives. If I start going faster and I'm talking while I'm doing this, so maybe I'll shut up for a second and try and cut a bit faster. It starts to look like it's almost straight up and down. But like, if you've ever watched any of Nathan's videos where he's like, chop, 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 he's still sliding a little bit, right? You don't have to slide like a slice, but when you're chopping, so like I'm push cutting, right? It almost looks like it's straight up and down, but I'm still sliding. And that, yeah, it's just, 
it takes less effort to cut that way and it's less damage to the edge when it runs into the cutting board. Helps your knife stay sharp longer too. Do you ever do the pull cut with the, the front of the knife? Like pull back, slight, like say, similar, very similar to what you just did, but like that? Because that's what I do. I do with my Tinker Tank. Yeah. It's really designed for that. This feels better for me on the push cut. Uh, but yeah, I do that sometimes. Cool. Uh, I do it uh, maybe more with a Nakiri. Seems to work really well with a Nakiri. Maybe it's just like more that kind of flat at the back and like little curve at the front, like Nakiri, Bunka, Santoku. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, <coughs> uh, I don't love waste, but also I think I kind of need to keep moving because my uh, potatoes are starting to discolor. So I'm going to leave these for later. And maybe Nathan will get the water boiling. We've got an Iwatani cassette burner, uh, which is a, a Japanese style butane burner, like a portable burner. And as compared to if you buy kind of like a Coleman brand where the flame goes out, this one, the flame goes in. So it works really well with, um, with a wok or a Donabe pot. Also, uh, we're gonna use a Yukihira pot, which is very, very thin steel. So it boils pretty quickly. Uh, ben wants to know, scallions or chives? I am going to use green onions, which are sometimes called scallions. I have a chive plant at home, so I use that one as well. Uh, you also get something called, um, they're come, sometimes called like Chinese scallions or uh, Chinese leeks or something, gao choy. Uh, they're not either, they're really their own thing. Those are really great in dumplings, like pork and Chinese leek chive combo hybrid thing, gao choy. Uh, in a dumpling, oh, that's really good. But uh, for this, I'm going to be garnishing with scallions or green onions. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to be doing, sorry, I'm going to be doing the, uh, the stir fried chicken with the green onions. This one, I'm going to garnish with cilantro, actually. Oh, I love this recipe. Yeah, <laughs> so Sky good. has had this one before. Um, Maybe I'll start on the sauce for it while the water's boiling. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Therese, Teresa was wondering, mm -hmm. uh, when do you use a soft cutting board, Hasegawa, versus hard cutting board, wood? They're both pretty soft. So right now I'm cutting on a larch wood board, which is end grain. The grain of the wood is pointing up. And so when you cut, it's a bit more like splitting kindling than it is chopping down an axe, if you've ever done any forestry, right? So like the grain of the wood kind of comes apart and comes back together. They're a bit self-healing. Larch is like, depending on how you look at it, either a soft hardwood or a hard softwood. Uh, and really, I think like the best choice for the edge of your knife is an end grain wooden cutting board. Second best choice, side grain wood or a softer plastic. And if you like sharp knives, those are more or less all the choices. So uh, I'm just kind of using what we have here today. Uh, I had the Hasegawa earlier. It's just kind of convenient because I was cutting chicken on it. It's like a little easier to clean, but I can cut chicken on a large wood board as well. Just like clean it really well with soap and water when you're done. Um, oh yeah, I forgot. I was also going to um, do a thing with the wok for the sauce for this one. I, I thought maybe I wouldn't, but Sichuan peppercorns, we're gonna have to do it. Yeah, Sichuan peppercorns are numbing. In Cantonese, they call them fa jiu, which is uh, like a flower pepper. They're, they're so aromatic. They come in red and green. I think the uh, green ones are a little bit more numbing. They do have a bit of numbness and it's awesome when you're eating spicy chilies because they kind of numb your tongue a bit so that you can eat more chili and enjoy the flavor without kind of like burning your face off. Anyway, I'm going to use a bit of these. If you don't have Sichuan peppercorn near you, I found a substitution. Black peppercorn, which you can get in pretty much any Western style grocery store, and coriander seed will approximate the flavor. It won't have the numbing effect, so sorry about that. But if you did want to try this and you don't have Sichuan peppercorn near you, uh, but it's worth seeking out just, there. Just get some fresh Botox and then eat it. Just eat the Botox, yeah, <laughs> no, just no, numb just, out your face. Yeah, you go to your doctor your oh, yeah. and you get some Botox. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I am, uh, once the water is boiled, going to. Uh, just like lightly stir fry some chilies and some Sichuan peppercorn. I, I am going to just like open them up and get some of the seeds out, both for presentation and because they're like pretty spicy. Are you um, boiling the potatoes or just like throwing them into the boiled water? 
uh, blanching them. So I like to boil the water, toss them in, yeah. and like not very long, like okay. 30 seconds, and then we'll drain them. Uh, I don't sure. think the water got salted yet. No, it didn't. Okay. We're pretty much boiling, so maybe I'll just bring yeah. that over. Yeah, amazing. Okay. Kyle is wondering, is this the same as your Christmas cookies? Christmas cookies. Uh, my Christmas cookies do have Sichuan peppercorn in them. It's really? something, yeah, I do like, um, oh wow, look at this thing. More fire. This thing boiled in like two minutes. Yeah, this Bananas. is, I love the, uh, the Yukihira pots because they boil so fast. And also, you know, using the Iwatani. Uh, I've been using uh, this Grosselle de Garande, which is like a French gray salt. Uh, which that I got. Doesn't sound very Chinese. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Uh, I got this from Say Cheese in the Crossroads Farmers Market. So shout out to our good friend Isaac Bignell. Uh, this stuff is great. I can't get enough of it. So a little salt in the water. I am going to toss my. Potato threads in. And. I am using vegetable potato here. And like most people are used to potato as a starch where you cook it a lot more and it gets like really starchy. But for uh, more like potato as a vegetable, we still want it a bit crunchy. So uh, I just kind of want to give it a very quick blanching here, but I still want it to have some crunch. So I'm not going to leave it in there for very long. You can do this as a stir fry as well. Like basically the same recipe as what I'm doing. Uh, but I toss it in, I'm going to wait until it comes back to a boil and then I'm going to dump it out. That's it. It's like really fast. I suppose I should wipe off my carbon steel knife while, uh, <laughs> while I'm doing that, eh? Uh, Nate was wondering, he was thinking about getting that aluminum pot until he read some things concerning health and sticking issues with aluminum cookware. Have you heard about this? Aluminum? Yeah. I've heard the like nonstick. Yeah. But. I yeah. About aluminum. I definitely heard about health concerns with, with aluminum. It's really related to Alzheimer's. Oh. Are these aluminum? I thought they were stainless steel. Sure yeah, I think they're stainless steel. Aluminum. I'll look it up real quick. All right. So you see, I didn't really do that for very long, right? Uh, but now I am going to pass off the pot and uh, I'm going to turn down the heat a bit on this and I am going to get my wok and I am going to. Uh, toss in some aromatics and just kind of toast those up a little bit. That was my cue to pass you the walk. That was uh, Nathan's cue to pass the walk. Thank you. How dry do you want these potatoes? I want them like decently dry. Okay. Yep. And uh, when they are dry, I have this nice bowl for them. Yep. I just double checked the, uh, those little pots are stainless steel and not aluminum. Yeah, the Yukihira pots are stainless and steel. I think aluminum is also fine. So. Yeah, I, I don't really know anything about aluminum cookware. All my stuff is steel. Whether aluminum it's... will make acidic foods taste weird. Oh really? Yeah. Eh? Yeah. Mm. You see them in professional kitchens a lot, and they're good for like boiling lots of water and stuff, but they're not good for cooking a lot of stuff. All right. So uh, for this step here, I still need to get some of the seeds out, but I don't want the wok too hot. For lots of stir frying, you want your wok like smoking hot. For this one, if I do that, it's actually going to be a bit of a problem because it will uh, scorch the chilies. And I don't want to scorch them. I just want to extract their flavor. These kind of chili peppers, they've got almost like, it's like these kind of dried chilies, right? Uh, it's funny actually, red chili peppers are such a huge part of Sichuan cuisine but they're not native to Sichuan, but you know, they've been using them there for hundreds of years and it's become integral to the cooking. Anyway, you smell that. It's like, it's like fruity, but like almost a bit floral. It's like quite aromatic. I want that in the oil. And uh, this kind of idea of getting chilies and Sichuan pepper corn together, uh, I think in Sichuan cooking, they call it like fragrant frying. I don't know how to say that in Mandarin, and I certainly don't know how to say that in Sichuanese, which is its own kind of dialect, right? But kind of their version of blooming spices. Blooming spices, yeah. Uh, fragrant frying, if you kind of do this, you could toss in lots of different vegetables. Like I love fragrant fried broccoli. 
Let's get a little oil in the pan. You're getting some love for your wok. Oh yeah. Is this the 36 centimeter? This is the big boy. I, I want this. Yeah, the Yamada. So. I, uh, I love the Yamada pans. They season really nicely. The handle doesn't get too hot. Like they're hand hammered. They're just really nice to work with. All right, chilies in. I'm getting a little bit of a sizzle, but they're not like smoking and going crazy. So my heat is at a good level. Uh, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight chilies. Good because eight is a lucky number in Chinese. And I've got like a little bit of Sichuan peppercorn, not like a crazy amount. You gotta be judicious, but also you gotta know how fresh your spices are. Like, I had gotten to the bottom of a bag of Sichuan peppercorns and woo, they were getting um, like kind of old, right? They'd lost a lot of their flavor and aromatics. And then I got a new bag and they were 10 times more powerful and I numbed my face out really badly. <laughs> Let him learn. Okay. So that was like really quick, right? That's actually done. Uh, shout out to Jacob at uh, Knife Work Calgary for lending me his big Yamada walk. Jacob, you're awesome. Jacob has recently discovered the joys of the Chinese cleaver. He was a Nikiri man for a long time and he resisted. And then we got the CCK vegetable chopper and it was love at first sight. There's been no looking back. Uh, Tyler L is asking, uh, how do I convince my wife into letting me buy one of those pants? <laughs> uh, tell her you'll cook her a lot of really tasty food in it. Mm. That's what I would recommend. Kyle is also asking, will you cook this for your staff at work? Asking for a friend. <laughs> well, I would cook this for my staff at work because I love my staff. Uh, yeah, maybe we could do like a staff lunch one time. Just one time? Just one time. <laughs> maybe two times. Only if they're really good though. Yeah. <laughs> if they make everyone happier than they arrived, then we'll see. Even my dad says, do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I've got my oil and um, my chilies in there. Like this is pretty typical where you don't strain those out. You leave them in and you kind of like eat around them. I wouldn't probably eat the chilies, but I'm, you know, I might eat the Sichuan peppercorns. They're at this point like kind of crunchy. Can we show this camera? Can we see, uh, can we see that? I've... Just hold it right in front of you. Yep. Tilt it that way. Right there? Just yeah, like that? Yeah, that's the shot. Okay. Um, I'm also going to put just a little bit of sesame oil on this. Don't need a lot, sesame oil is like pretty aromatic. And uh, I am gonna get some cilantro in there. I feel like I'm forgetting something. So I'm just gonna work on my cilantro while I remember what the thing is that I'm forgetting. Was it oh, spring oh. onions? Uh, nope. Uh, Nathan has my, uh, my grocery we're gonna, list. We're gonna post these li um, things, recipes, as, as a blog. Yeah, we uh, will. Cilantro. Chili oil, vinegar, salt, sesame oil. The vinegar! That's what I was forgetting. The vinegar! Hey, yao, chile. Which means, for crying out loud in Cantonese, all my staff know that because I scold them in Cantonese all the time. This guy's <laughs> nodding because she used to work at the Calgary store. Uh, I really like black vinegar. This is, uh, this is not from um, either of the two regions that I'm cooking from. This is from Jiangsu province. So in the sort of like Shanghainese world, um, like they use a lot of fermented vinegars and like fermented wines, like the, the flavor of fermentation is really big in, in the cuisine of that area. And I really like this. Uh, it's got like real depth of flavor. If you can't find it, you can substitute apple cider vinegar if that works really well. Rice vinegar works. So I'm gonna splash a little bit of that on. I imagine I probably need a bit of salt on there. Well, that was fun. Yeah. 
And I'm going to pick off the leaves, which I will cut separately from the stalks. The uh, stalks are pretty flavorful. I do like cilantro stalks. And they're soft enough that they're not really going to, um, they're not going to be like woody, you know? Like there's some herb stems that I wouldn't use in something unless they're cooked. I find parsley stems to be a bit like kind of too woody to eat raw if I'm trying to impress people. But I also did say we're going kind of more home style today. Uh, it's just that also I want to cut these two things differently. I want to cut the stems a, a bunch finer so that they're not as chunky and the leaves can be a bit bigger, which I think will give me a slightly nicer presentation. Presentation is not my specialty. Uh, Fear not, we're doing a plating video soon. Oh good, maybe I'll learn a thing. Yeah, well, maybe, like, not soon, but like, you know. Coming up? December, maybe. <laughs> okay, yeah. soon enough. That's, that's, that's soon as far as Earth scheduling goes. Yeah, yeah. soonish. Yeah. I've waited long enough to learn how to plate. I can wait till December. Mm -hmm. I am desperately looking for a good squeeze bottle. Just like, you know, like the ketchup mm -hmm. bottles, so you can do the fancy drizzles and stuff. Get a bottle of sriracha, eat yeah. it, and then wash it out. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> yeah, but like, I'm the kind of person that wants like the handcrafted squeeze bottle. Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's me. Hand I'm the problem. Plastic, yeah. yeah, hand handcrafted yeah, plastic. There's not a lot of plastic artists left to get. I just need to find an, somebody who does epoxy craft. <laughs> That'd be amazing. If you do, we should carry them at Knifeware. Yep. Handcrafted, artisanal, local, free-range, organic squeeze bottles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, BPA free. Don't forget that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're getting a lot of comments that say big-headed shrimp. What does this mean? Dai <laughs> <laughs> ha uh, means someone who's a bit absent-minded, someone who's like kind of forgetful. We've got someone who shall remain unnamed. I don't want to, you know, shame them on the live stream, but we've got someone at the store who's they're a bit of a big head shrimp sometimes, but we, we turn it into a funny joke because, uh, and this is where like speaking a couple of languages gets fun and playful. Uh, a lobster in Cantonese is a long ha, which means a dragon shrimp. And so it, it has nothing to do with the expression of someone who's a big head shrimp, dai tao ha. Uh, but we have this person at the store who is aspiring to be a dragon shrimp. And then, you know, then maybe they won't be as absent-minded. And so, yeah, it's, it's fun. The drag, wanting to be a dragon shrimp wouldn't, I think, make sense to anyone who's Cantonese. But in our store, it does, where we're just, like, playing with language. I feel like I'd want to be a mantis shrimp, you know? Have... You are a mantis shrimp oh. already, oh, Sky. thank you. I've always thought so. <laughs> you know, they can see, like, more rainbows than we can even dream of. And also shoot little, like, water cannons that are stronger than guns. Like... Dang. All right. You know what I need? Right. I need a Jastura spoon. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Why don't we have a gold one? We should have a gold one in here. Yeah, we should. Uh, these things are awesome for all types of like stirring and serving. They're exactly a tablespoon. They've got a bit of a lip around the outside, so they kind of have some surface tension, like a measuring spoon, but also like nice long handles. So I'm just going to mix this up now that I've got uh, my fragrant oil and I've got salt and I've got uh, the black vinegar, and then I will garnish with some cilantro, and then we'll put this aside. I, I want it to cool off. This is best served, I think, at room temperature. So I, uh, oh, look at that one. That one uh, made it through quality control. We'll just uh, toss that one out. <laughs> Don't tell chef. Okay. When you're done, will you tilt that towards can be? You bet. For a good shot. All right, so I'm kind of squishing up my cilantro leaves, and I'm just going to kind of like rough chop those. And... I might hold on to the gesture in case I need that later, but like, there's my dish. I'll try and make it look pretty by kind of wiping around the outside a little bit. But there we go. That one is ready once it cools off, once it comes to room temperature. All right. Beautiful. One side dish down. Rice is on the go, Nathan? Yeah, I heard it beep, so I think Kay. it's cooking. I don't know. Yeah. I've never used it as before. Does, uh, is the keep warm button on? Uh, yeah. And it's Perfect. L031. Okay. That means I think that it is cooked and it is just keeping warm. Great. Yeah. Yep. Good. Find out when we open it. Yeah. While you uh, reset there, 
Our friend Todd March wants to know, uh, Shun be Vegetable Cleaver versus CCK's Small Slicers. Ooh. Uh, the Shun Vegetable Cleaver is shorter. The edge is curvier. It's made of a harder steel, so it will stay sharp longer. Uh, it's a bit heavier. Like, uh, it's not quite as thin as the stainless slicer that we carry. There are a bunch of, you know, like CCK knives that we don't carry as well, so to be fair. Um, I think you go for the Shun if you want something that's like very stainless, holds an edge really well, has like an integral D-shaped handle. It's got a really nice bolster on it, and it's a lot curvier. Some people like to rock more, and the CCKs are pretty flat. You don't rock a lot with those. The CCK... Being longer is going to be a little more versatile. Like it's easier to cut big things with a big knife. Uh, it's not going to stay sharp quite as long, but it might be a little thinner kind of all the way up if you were cutting some like bigger, denser things like squash or big sweet potatoes. Both are good. I, I think the Shun is nicer looking, honestly. CCK have like a rugged, natural beauty. They're um, very functional and utilitarian. I think they're also beautiful, but I think like... In a, in a sense of being more refined and kind of like pretty as far as knives go, shoons are just like really well designed. My mom has a whole set of them. I've used lots of shoons. They're great. Cool. What's next? Uh, next, I need to make my next side dish, which is going to be smashed cucumbers. Pak chingwa. Uh, I have a long English cucumber. You could use really any type of cucumber for this. But let's get something that I can do some smashing with. I don't think I would want to smash with my Takeda. Skateboard deck? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, well, I'm obviously going to do it with a cleaver, oh, not a skateboard yeah, deck. Yeah. <laughs> Mandolins, skateboard decks. Yeah. This is a wild man here. Crimson record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nope, not going to work. But thanks for the suggestion. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm tempted to just smash it with the Cow Kong chopper because, like, that thing is badass. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, maybe I will. Because as much as this bad boy uh, looks like a butchery cleaver, it's not. It's still a Chinese-style chef's knife. But this is pretty heavy duty. And this dish that I'm going to make isn't like the finest here. There's going to be like a, a bunch of smashing, which is fun. Um, Gao Gong is a city in China. And apparently the shape of the city looks like this. And that gives this knife its name. It's definitely got some weight. Like this is a thicker, sturdier one. You could chop, like you could chop some small pork ribs with this, especially if they were cooked and it would like laugh at them. But today we are gonna smash cucumbers. You, uh, you probably can't see this on the camera. I've got like a little ding in the edge, it's bent. Cause I tried this on a cooked ham bone. I was like, let's see what this thing can do. I did the research for you. This is not the right knife for that job. I damaged the edge. It's fine. It's fine. But like, uh, it wasn't pretty. So I'm going to just top and tail this. And I'll cut it up into some chunks. And now we get to smash, which is the fun part. Oh yeah. I just got it on Sky. Sorry, Sky. <laughs> Getting splattered with cucumber. <laughs> the hazards of uh, making YouTube videos with me. I mean, I've been splattered with egg, like Kevin threw soy sauce at our laptop one time. Nathan's always doing something explosive, <laughs> briefly off screen. All right. So the reason why I'm smashing this because is it creates this kind of nice rough texture and surface area. And so I'm just going to kind of like pull apart some of the pieces. And then I'm going to make sure that I get some of these uh, seeds out. The seeds have a lot of water in them. And so I don't really want a lot of that in my salad because I, it will dilute the flavor. So I'm just kind of like take out some of those. Something I really love cleavers for is anything where I'm doing a horizontal cut because it's really easy to tell the pitch of your knife. Why do you want a rough surface area? More surface area, because it's rough, will hold more flavor. Uh, but also it creates an interesting texture in the mouth. And, uh, you know, people are different about texture, but like texture is an element of cuisine which can be controlled for culinary purposes, right? So it's nice sometimes to have those, you know, beautiful, smooth cuts where you put something in your mouth and it's... Um, I hope I'm remembering the right word, but it's like, what? 
like something like slippery, like smooth. And it's like, it's a beautiful feeling in your mouth. But also it can be nice to have something that's like a little bit kind of rough uh, and kind of excites the inside of your mouth with like a little bit of a tickle. Like and subscribe for tickly mouthfeel. Okay, so scoop that out of the way and get all my chunks together. This is definitely kind of like more rustic vibes when you smash stuff like that. The pieces aren't gonna be like super even. Now remember, we don't wanna like scrape the edge. I almost did it there. I'm gonna put my edge down and move the stuff towards it. Line it all up so that I can get sort of like semi even pieces, even though the outsides of them. Adjust my grip here. Okay. Beautiful. If I really want to be fancy, I could salt these. I'm not going to be bothered with that today. We're going to go a little easier with that. Wipe off my carbon steel knife. Wipe off my board. And then uh, we're going to do some more smashing. This is a really garlicky dish, so I'm going to get out some garlic cloves. Now, I could be all delicate and start like peeling this. Not today. <laughs> Woo! I think I switched cameras just in time. <laughs> so I'll just like fish out some of the chunks here. And I might even get to do another smash because I probably didn't get through enough of them, which is fine. I do need some garlic for later, so I should remind myself not to use all of that. Ooh, that one's not very good. Lumative is asking, uh, bigger knife equals more texture? Uh, so the smashing is what gives it that rough texture, but also sometimes like wedging. So we talk a lot at Knifeware about the beauty of the thin knife that goes through things really easy and leaves this really smooth texture. Uh, something like this, if you're cutting dense stuff like carrots and potato, it does not go through it near as easy. You gotta like, you gotta put more force into it, right? And it will wedge on stuff and it'll crack. Uh, but if you're comfortable with that, you can kind of like use the cracking to your advantage on something like a big squash. And it will leave that kind of rougher texture, which will grab onto more sauce and hold more of the sauce on the thing. So it's not necessarily that, uh, the flavor itself is necessarily better, but it does hold more sauce that way if it's got a rougher texture. We're getting a lot of God bless the cleaver. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise cleaver, amen, I believe. <laughs> You're a cleaver believer, eh? Yep. I am uh, up here proselytizing for the cleaver. <laughs> Trying to get conversion because uh, I love all knives. All knives are beautiful. I have almost every shape of knife you can imagine. The next one on my list being a Deba because I'm tired of borrowing the one from the store every time I want to butcher a fish. Uh, but I love cleavers. They're just like, they're my favorite shape. I have been known to uh, argue that they are the greatest knife shape of all time. I am super biased, so don't take my word as gospel, but also the gospel of Cleaver says this is the greatest knife shape of all time. You can do everything with it. Have I used any other knives yet today? I guess the peeler, I could have peeled it. You know what? I'm going to peel ginger with my cleaver later just to make a point. Hmm. Yep. Uh, Nate F is asking, is there a point to scaling fish if you'll be cutting the skin off? Uh, so remember earlier I was talking about that steamed fish? Yeah. You eat it with the skin on, so yeah, I would definitely take the scales off. They're not fun to chew on. But if you're taking the, if you're cutting the skin off, you wouldn't need to scale it, right? I think, yeah, if you can get the skin off without running into the scales, I think the advantage of scaling it even though you're going to skin it is because it preserves the edge of your knife. You don't want to run into the scales with the edge of your knife. They can be quite hard. Uh, but, you know, it depends on what knife you're doing and what you're doing with it. I, I really like skin with the fish on. Skin with the fish mm, on? Fish with the skin on. I do like my skin with a little fish on. Yeah. <laughs> I usually have a bit of uh, fish on my skin. Yeah. That's my favorite part of the fish, though, seriously. Like, 
my, my father-in-law asked me to take the skin off some salmon recently, and I was sad about that. Devastating. Yeah. I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah. Brutal. Okay, so I, like I said, I'm not doing like pretty fancy things. If you watch my other video where I'm uh, slicing thin bits of garlic, how many did I get uh, when I was blindfolded? Was it like 14, 15 yeah, slices, 14. something like that? It, no, it was 15, wasn't yeah. it? So I'm not doing that today. We are gonna crush and press. So I'm just gonna press down and smoosh. Mm. Press down and smoosh. That's a technical term. We've got the stiction, the scoopage, the smoosh. Okay. Ooh, we've got a hot take in the comments. Okay. Uh, serrated blade equals more food texture, which is kind of true in some way. <laughs> kind of true. That's forbidden knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. I don't want to admit that. Deep cuts. <laughs> There's a limit, though, to like uh, how much texture is good. In the case of smashed cucumbers, it's good because it gets a lot of the water out, right? There's like water all over my board after I smashed it, and water dilutes the flavor. But uh, let's imagine that you are uh, tearing up your steak with a serrated knife. A lot of that flavor that's coming out in the form of juice would be better in the steak. I've taken to uh, dry brining my steaks for at least a day, if not two, and it gets rid of the excess water. It leaves a lot of that delicious flavor in them. And I can cook a steak medium rare, and after resting it, you go and you cut it, and your plate isn't covered with juice. All that juice, all that flavor is in the steak. So, yeah, like sometimes cutting stuff with a serrated knife is convenient, especially bread. But um, I wouldn't want to cut a tomato with a serrated knife. I'd like a lot of that flavor to stay in the tomato. I just picture somebody carving a serrated knife. <laughs> oh, the horror. There is a measure of truth to that. Like I'm writing a, a blog for our website right now called What's the Sharpest Knife? And there's a section in it, if we want to get really nerdy, that goes yeah, into... Yeah, if we want to get really nerdy. Yeah, we do want to get really nerdy. And it goes into uh, differential grit sharpening, which kind of creates micro serrations on the edge of your knife, but not serrations that are really hard to work with. It's serrations that you sharpen into your blade with the grit of the stone, basically. So you can still, like, touch it up. You can still do your own sharpening without going with, like, a metal dowel through every single serration of your bread knife. So there's kind of like a happy medium in this, and it's true that like some roughness on your edge makes more texture, makes more flavor. Um, we even, one of our videos that we uh, feature Masashi in, we're talking about how he slices ham and the flavor changes depending on the, the grits of whetstone that he's using. And that's a real, real deep cut. That is super nerdy. But we, he came here and we did it and we tried it. And it really does make a difference, which is kind of an, an interesting rabbit hole that you can go down if you're into that sort of thing. What are we making now? Uh, now I'm making the sauce for the cucumbers. So uh, there will be measurements in the blog post. I don't really measure this stuff. Go on. What is this, baking? <laughs> yeah, it's not baking. This is why I'm terrible at baking. Uh, I've got homemade chili oil. So there's chili and there's a, a little bit of sesame seed in there. I put a little bit of sesame oil, which is nice for the kind of aromatic flavoring. A little bit of light soy, a little bit of dark soy, a bunch of sugar. I'm going to stir that up. Now, if you want to get really fancy with this particular dish, you can make aromatic soy sauce, which takes a bit of time. You've got to have a bunch of ingredients, but you get, um, you know, star anise and black cardamom and cinnamon and uh, Sichuan peppercorn and cloves and a whole bunch of like ginger. And you put it in soy sauce with a little bit of sugar and you simmer it for half an hour. And this infuses all those flavors into the soy sauce. It also reduces it down so it gets like a little bit thicker. And that would be what I would use if I wanted to be like more fancy. I'm kind of approximating it because I didn't happen to have that on hand and I didn't have time to make a batch by using a bit of light and dark soy together and some sugar. It's not gonna have all the other aromatics in it, but um, yeah, something to try. It keeps for a long time. You can like make a batch of it and just have it around. That's fun, I might try that. Let's get me garlic in there as well. Mm. Uh, we had somebody asking how you don't cut yourself when you scoop up your food. Okay, so uh, first of all, like 
I can touch the edge, I'm not going to get cut, right? If I slide, I'll get cut. So I am cutting into my hand and I'm not going to get cut. But also, and this is a very important feature or uh, technique, I guess, when you are scooping, you want to keep the edge low so you're not hitting the edge. You don't want to like scrape the edge on the cutting board. And when you scoop, you scoop past your hand. Can, uh, can we see this guy? Yeah, if you're, uh, you can just keep working on the board. Okay. That's pretty clear. So uh, the edge is past my hand. It, I see sometimes people want to scoop with the back of their knife, but then your fingers are right near the edge. That's very dangerous. Don't do it that way. Scoop, go past your hand, and then you can move stuff around. There you Ooh, have it. Garlic is sticky. Oh yeah, my, uh, my sauce is getting really nice and goopy there. But I tell you what, I'm not gonna put that on the cucumbers right now because the soy sauce is quite salty. And if I do, a lot of the water is gonna come out of the cucumbers. So I'm gonna not dress it until we're ready to serve. When we are, we're gonna put that on and uh, we'll put some sesame seeds on just for like extra little juge, right? Fun. That goes with that and cucumbers. We've got some requests for more oil recipes. Just trying mm. to find a good one similar to the heavenly hot stuff. I don't know that I've heard about that. Oh yeah. Uh, so like basic chili oil, you know, you gotta heat your oil up, uh, but you don't want it too hot because it'll um, it'll burn your chilies. So like, uh, I tend not to use a thermometer. I just like heat it up and pour some in and see how hot it is. I want like a really good sizzle, but if it's sizzling too much, I'll add some cold oil to cool it off. Stir while you go. And you can add lots of other stuff to an aromatic soy sauce. Uh, like this just has a little bit of, as I mentioned, sesame, uh, sesame seeds, but you can add um, like all kinds of other spices to it. Um, Fuchsia Dunlop is a really good uh, resource for that sort of thing. Her book, uh, The Food of Sichuan, is a classic. It's in its second edition. She's, uh, she's British, but she was like one of the first Westerners to study at the Sichuan Provincial Cooking School, which is like a, a very prestigious cooking school in Sichuan province. And so like uh, I've had a lot of recipes from her. We had her Shanghainese cookbook for a while. Um, land of fish and rice. I guess technically it's not like all Shanghainese, it's like that whole region, the uh, Jiangnan kind of region. Um, yeah, I tend to only make just kind of like basic chili oil, but I was at a dumpling place not too long ago and they had really good chili oil. I think they had um, cumin seeds, cardamom seeds, as well as sesame seeds and the chilies, that was really tasty. What was I doing? Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna get ready to prep my last dish. How's our time? Uh, we're about 50 minutes behind the schedule, but okay. I think we're doing good on questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks everyone work. for all the questions. I'm really uh, loving the engagement. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's part of why I wanted to do this. You know, I've made a, a couple of Cleaver videos and I was like, well, Maybe I'll just cook some stuff and people can ask me some questions and then we get to find out what you want to know, like what you're interested in. So keep the questions coming. That's awesome. Totally. Uh, Nate was wondering if there are any vegetarian Chinese recipes to recommend that don't use deep frying besides mapo tofu. Um, honestly, the one that you were telling me about, uh, the, the celery and uh, smoked tofu relish. Oh, yeah. Why don't yeah. you tell them about that? Because that's a... That's a good one. I don't know. You've probably made that one more than I have. I, now. Yeah, I, it's like my my like comfort food now. Um, but that's a really awesome one. That's basically just uh, smoked tofu that's diced up. Uh, you blanch a little bit of celery. Um, what else is in there? You make kind of like a an oil out of uh, Szechuan peppercorns, and I do uh, light soy sauce and some sugar and stuff in there. Um, Gosh, what else in that? It's just that. And, oh, and there's uh, peanuts too. The the Szechuan peppercorn roasted peanuts, which are super, super good. And it's like packed with protein. It's totally vegan. You serve it over rice. It's great. Highly recommend. Yep. I mean, there's a whole school of Chinese cuisine that is entirely vegan, and that would be Buddhist cuisine. So if you want to look for that sort of thing, uh, there's a long tradition of it. Their mock meat game is on point. 
Yeah. Uh, like, I've had, um, okay, it's like a little bamboo skewer with a uh, textured vegetable protein wrapped around it in the shape of a chicken wing. And you could bake those if you don't want to deep fry them and then toss them in sauce. Ooh, those are good. And really satisfying to, you know, eat vegan food off of something that's like, feels like a bone, like a little stick to eat it off of. Um, but um, it's funny, like at the Hong Luck Kung Fu Club where I did uh, field work for my PhD, uh, we had someone who is vegetarian and he was trying to explain to some people um, that he didn't eat meat. And they're just like, oh, so you want fish? Like, what do you mean you don't eat meat? And then, uh, and then I said, oh, he eats Buddhist vegetarian. Kaisik. Zai, like, Zai is uh, Buddhist food. And they're like, oh, of course, why didn't you just say so? And then they brought out vegan food for him, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's worth looking into. We're getting some love for Fuchsia Dunlop, too. Oh, Fuchsia Dunlop's awesome. Shout out to Fuchsia Dunlop. I've learned a lot of stuff from her cookbooks. Um, she's just published a new book that's kind of like memoirs of eating in China. I really want to check that out. Mm. Yeah. All right, so I promised I was going to peel ginger with a cleaver. Uh, <laughs> I would do it kind of something like this, like top. With your biggest cleaver. With my biggest cleaver. Top, tail, get some nice flat sides, and then just take it off. I thought you were going to peel it in your hand. Ah, go on. <laughs> Real quick, if anybody got the email like two months ago about these little pruning herb snip guys. Oh, hey, the Chica we Masa. Just got, we just got them back in the warehouse and they're back in stock. Sweet. They might sell out quickly. So they're like, these little ones are like 18 bucks. I just picked up a pair. Nice. So. I got one too and I've been loving them for harvesting. Yeah. All right, so Nathan wants to see me peel stuff in my hand. Oh God. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> of course, there's like a big knobby knot there. <laughs> oh, we no, 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 we're good. <laughs> we're the first aid kit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm impressed, Colin. You're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and like, I'm not wasting all of this stuff. I will save that. I would put that in a stock. Like offcuts, uh, offcuts of ginger, like the tops of green onions. I guess today probably I don't have an actual stock bag going, but if I'm at home, I would have a, a stock bag on the go. Mm. Uh, our friend Lumative is asking if you're in next week. He's got a couple of knives to check out and can bring some down. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in. Come on down to the Calgary store. So I'm getting my uh, ginger and garlic going. And uh, remember I talked about like doing stuff home style. Like I'm not even going to line this up. These pieces are going to be super uneven. And... That is okay with me. <laughs> it's rustic. Yeah. That's how I cook. Just, just happy accidents. You can really see the uh, the food release on the Takeda cleaver in action here. Yeah. This thing is incredible. There's a bit of stiction, but a lot of it just falls right off. Turn that on an angle. Oh, did I actually catch myself? I did catch myself a bit when I was peeling. You bad it or you good? Let me see. <laughs> mm, I think we're good. Extra flavor. I tell you, every time I come to the YouTube studio, I end up doing something like <laughs> <laughs> questionable. <laughs> Uh, the Takeda is a much thinner, more delicate cleaver, very hard steel. I am not going to smash garlic with this one. Uh, it does taper a lot. The spine is quite thick right at the back where it connects to the handle. So that's where I'm going to press on the garlic. I'm going to make sure that no part of the knife is touching on the cutting board. Oh, yeah, maybe I will take that band-aid. <laughs> oh, no. Brief intermission. Uh, this is what I get for trying ridiculous things on the internet. 
Hey, Sky, <laughs> can you uh, can you edit this out in real time? Nope. No, sorry. no magic. <laughs> Just like be right back. <laughs> Yeah, Mike nicked himself one time when we were shooting a, a Hanasuki video. Yeah. Or, no, it was just like a boning knife comparison or something. And we he, he just kept going and he was like bleeding on the chicken. And we were like, Mike, you got to stop. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. And that's why you don't do crazy stuff, kids. <laughs> Listen to your knife mom. Yep. And don't do what I do. <laughs> I have a tendency to put like a little too much garlic and ginger in, I think for uh, some Cantonese people's taste. So mm. out of respect, I am going to use a little less, but also it depends on how good your garlic is. Like my mom grows garlic and she gives me a clove of that. Shout out to my mom. Uh, and it is really strong. Like rather than using an entire bulb of, you know, cheap dried out old garlic, I would be using like one clove of my mom's garlic. Same thing with my dad. Shout out to my dad. He grows good garlic as well. <laughs> yeah, your mom's garlic scape pesto still oh, yeah. like lives in my dreams rent free. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, sometimes I don't bother with the like little dry bits at the bottom. And, uh, you know, one of my coworkers was saying their chef shouted at them for cutting those off when they were working in the kitchen because there is still flavor and they can get cooked down. But for whatever reason, I'm going to take those off. Maybe I'm trying to redeem myself after that fiasco trying to peel ginger in my hand. I'm sorry. That's my fault. <laughs> That's okay. The person who likes to do dumb shit on the internet. Uh, and so I'm not going to, again, do like the smash and press like I did with the cow Kong chopper, but I'm not going to do like super fine brunoise with these. I'm just going to kind of chop them up. Todd Marsh says he cuts himself with his CCK more than any other knife. <laughs> it's really rare that I cut myself with a cleaver. I find it's like very nice and safe as long as you have, you know, your claw going and like there's no pointy tip, right? Uh, but yeah, um, peeling stuff in your hands. Yep. Um, I'm ashamed. Luckily, I think I didn't bleed on the food at all. <laughs> My moment of pride was when I was talking to some customers in the store about Chinese cleavers. And I was talking about how far away the, the edge is from like everything else that's happening. So it's really rare that you cut yourself. And then as I was wiping off the demo knife with a sponge, I managed to nick myself. <laughs> and she was like, did you just cut yourself? I was like, oh, no, it's just fine. <laughs> Hide it behind my back. Like, so anyways, speaking well, of which, <laughs> wiping cleavers, guys. right? You can't reach the edge. And some people will be tempted to do this. Never do that with a cleaver. Yeah. That is a recipe for cutting yourself. Put a towel on your hand and wipe away from the edge. All right. So I've got my uh, garlic and ginger ready. And I am going to toss in a few fermented black beans. If you can't get these at your local store, a lot of grocery stores in Canada will have, and you know, probably other parts of our viewership's world, uh, will have like a pre-made black bean sauce, which will have some garlic in it, it'll have some other stuff. I'm just using like straight up fermented black beans. They've got a really deep, rich aroma. There's like a lot of umami in these things. They're pretty salty. But I'm, I'm not making a black bean sauce here, right? So I'm just going to put out like a few of those. Anybody want to give that a smell? You ever smelled this stuff? No. If you're interested in oh, fermentation it's, and it's preservation, like uh, yeah. we've yeah. got a great video coming out on Monday uh, where we are nerding out with Nathan in his kitchen about all ways to preserve, ferment, um, and Pickles. keep pickle your harvest. Yeah. yeah. Soak it in booze. Soak it in booze. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how you pickle it. It's just one of those things. Okay, so I just kind of like chopped up those. All of my, my black beans, my garlic, and my ginger are like roughly the same size. And they don't have to be roughly the same amount. I probably have uh, like three fifths ginger and 
Uh, I don't know. I don't know what ratios are, but like more ginger than garlic and more garlic than black beans. How about that? But uh, with this kind of recipe where it's like the one meat, one vegetable stir fry, you can really adjust the amounts to taste. You know, if you like more garlic, you like more ginger, like whatever it is, you can uh, do it how you want. Now I'm going to get out some of these baby Shanghai bok choys and I'll pick off any of the kind of bruised outer leaves. Some of these have had a hard life. Uh, but I'm not going to really pick off all the leaves. I'm going to quarter these and we'll have them in kind of big chunks. And luckily Nathan has provided me with a plethora of bowls. They're just like quarters. I might take off a bit of the stem on this guy because he's very stemmy. I don't mean science, technology, engineering, and math. Although who knows? Wow. <laughs> Academic joke, sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> ba <-doom -tsh. laughs> Any other questions? Uh, there are a couple of jokes about you cutting yourself. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little while back, um, Lumidiv, the guy that wants to come see you next week, uh, he was talking about an oil that has really soft chili flakes in it, uh, not the dried, crunchy ones, which I love that like hot chili oil. Mm. Um, but I don't think I've ever had anything like that. Do you? Have you soft tried a soft chili, chili flakes? Chili oil, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, old dry mother is a pretty famous uh, old dry mother old dry mother that's okay. the way it like translates uh lao gum ma I, that my, <laughs> like i said my manner is really bad but it's like a pretty famous hot chili oil and it's got um you know like chilies that are i don't know they're not, i don't think they're like fresh chilies i think they're dry but they're mm. not so hard that you couldn't eat them mm. yeah Are we going to be blanching this or stir-frying it? Uh, they're going to be stir-fried. I might have to get Nathan to give them a quick wash and then bring them back in our fancy strainer pan. Whoa, tell me about it. Uh, this is part of our sort of mise en place collection. They also have a plastic lid on them, so kind of great when you want to wash some veggies and then uh, store it and it will drain all of the water out. I mean, like shake your veggies off, but they're still going to drip, right? You don't want a bunch of water, again, getting into your stir fry and diluting the flavors. God, it's great having an assistant like this. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't he great? <laughs> Just makes things happen. Okay. And the last thing I need to chop up for this one before I start making my sauce are the scallions. Thank you, sir. They pay me for it. Yeah. And uh, these I'm just going to do in little rounds. Nothing too fancy. But uh, for those of you who are looking at getting a cleaver, it's really important to understand the edge profile, that it's flat in the middle. So I see sometimes like first time people grab a cleaver, they're trying to chop at the back, but that's where it curves the most, right? So this is the flat spot. It still does curve a little bit, right? That's like about how much it would rock. So I'm rocking a tiny bit. Also, if you're using a heavier cleaver, get used to the rhythm where you are gonna push it forward, stop supporting the weight, and then pick it up again. So like if I exaggerate, I'm basically dropping it onto the food, right? Super sharp. And once you get rid of the, uh, once you get used to that rhythm, of tension and release. That's how you can start getting like pretty quick with your chopping. Kyle from Knife Work Calgary likes to talk about it as the bounce. You, you figure out how your knife bounces and it like comes off the cutting board and it rebounds and then you uh, cut back. Okay, so this is uh, part of the reason why I like a big cutting board 
because I do my mise en place on the board. Can be helpful to put it into bowls and stuff. Um, when I was looking at our mise en place setup here, it already had a bunch of stuff in it, so I didn't uh, grab that off the shelf. <laughs> but um, mise en place bowls can be pretty nice as well. Now I need to make some sauce for this, and I also need to make something to thicken the sauce. I'm gonna make a bit of a cornstarch slurry, but let's start with this. My homemade chicken stock, which is finally defrosted. It's still really thick. Oh yeah, that's like goopy thick. Beautiful. And put a bit of sugar in it. I don't wanna make this one too sweet, but a bit of sugar is nice. If I was using like a store-bought chicken stock, I probably wouldn't even put any salt in it because store-bought chicken stock has like quite a bit of salt and possibly some MSG. But my homemade stock does not, so I actually am going to use a bit of salt in this. Back to my fancy French hand-harvested gray salt. It's funny that we are doing the Chinese food live stream because I just got one of those calls where you answer and they're just speaking Chinese. <laughs> They're hungry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they heard the live stream. They got no, questions. Food, yeah. <laughs> um, Go I am going to put a bit of the cooking wine in there. <laughs> I'm going to put a bit of soy sauce in here. One of our viewers asked again how to scoop up the ingredients without cutting your hand, and I mentioned that we talked about that when we did the garlic, yeah. and he said, sorry, was distracted by his PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, well, thank you. All right. Does a 195 Danka count as a cleaver? I'm going to say yes. If it's the Nakiri, maybe. <laughs> yeah, the, the 195 Nakiri? Yeah, why not? That's a dank knife. For real. More like a, a danka, am I right? Danka. Uh, I always forget to call you doctor. I apologize. It's okay. Some people now call me Mr. Doctor. <laughs> and it's become a thing. Mr. Doctor. I've started fondly calling people Mr. Whatever. So <laughs> when you came in that one time, I was like, oh, Mr. Colin. You were like, doctor, sorry. Yeah. You know, no, you, like. You worked for it. You I worked for it. For it. Like. You gotta call me doctor, it's just a thing. Yeah. Yep. I think I am ready to get stir frying on the last dish, Great. which is good because uh, we're just about at the end of our live stream here. Getting and hungry. I'm getting hungry, yeah. I'm working up a storm here, so. Do you want me to wipe out the oil that's in the bottom of this? Uh, yeah, maybe wipe it with a paper towel. It's probably like a bit the wrong flavor there. Nate's asking, what's the secret to a good fried rice? And I would say a wok and MSG. What and would you day say? Day old rice. And day old rice. Yeah, the rice needs to be kind of dried out. If you try and make fried rice with fresh rice, not going to work. Yeah, it's just going to steam itself. Basically, there's too much moisture in it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Love this wok. Love this burner. I recently put a, a new uh, fume hood in my house so that I could do more stir frying and uh, actually have all the smoky stuff go somewhere. So let's. I have a fume hood. It's called opening the window, and then when the alarm, smoke alarm goes off, I just stand by the door and use it like a giant fan. Oh, genius. <laughs> Do you want to come help me cook at my yeah, place? Because, sure. like, you'd be I'll, amazing. I'll be the doorman, and you can feed me. Uh, here's a trip, uh, trick for a stir fry. Sesame oil loses a lot of its flavor and aroma if it gets too hot. So that's why you don't cook things in sesame oil. I'm going to put a little bit of this in at the end, but I'm not gonna put it in the sauce because I don't want to get cooked that way. And uh, while my wok is heating up here, I'm gonna pull out this bag of white powder. Do not call the cops, this is cornstarch. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna put this in. You can do your cornstarch slurry with just water, but I tend to do it uh, sometimes with soy sauce because that adds a little bit more flavor. That's smart, mm. I should do that. Now, I do want my wok smoking hot because I'm gonna do the chicken first and I'm gonna take the chicken out. And then I'm gonna put the aromatics in and I'm gonna do the veggies and add the chicken back, the sauce, and then thicken the sauce and then we're done. Okay, slurry ready, sauce ready, wok 
smoking. Sky and I did a video testing pans, and these Yamada pans on an Iwatani burner heat up to smoking hot in, what is it, like 57 seconds? They're fast, like cooking heat. I love it. Yeah. <clears throat> Always, always, always when you're cooking, uh, a lot of people are used to nonstick pans, but like this is carbon steel, right? Heat up your pan first, then add the fat or oil. Okay, so I got my chicken. That oil is smoking. The Iwatani, pretty powerful. It's like 11,000 BTUs, but like a commercial stove in a Chinese restaurant would be more like 200,000 BTUs. So like, <laughs> obviously it's not gonna cook as fast as that. If this was a commercial kitchen, I'd be done already. It's crazy. But still, like it does get way hotter than just, um, you know, your kind of standard uh, flat top stove or electric stove. If you have a, a gas stove at home, you can get adapters that will force the flame the way the Iwatani is rather than going out. Like if you're cooking on a pan, you want the heat to go out, but the wok is curved, right? Um, I, have, I have this 36 oh. centimeter. Yep. And I use it in my backyard over my fire. Oh, cool. It's really, you have to like make a wooden handle to like extend the handle. That works yeah. really well. For a truly authentic experience, cook with your wok over a volcano. You're good to go. Uh, ben is asking, how do these woks cook on induction burners? They work like they are made of steel, right? So uh, the thing with an induction burner is that it needs to be magnetic. And these are steel, they stick to a magnet, therefore you can cook on induction. I haven't tried it personally, but the science is there. I, I have a glass top, and I use, so I use a wok fairly often at home. And for me, the trick is a long preheat at a low heat to really heat up the pan and get it hot. Yeah. And then you crank it and let it go for another 30 seconds and then it works pretty well. Toss in my aromatics after taking out the chicken. I don't want to cook this for too long. I just want to get the aroma infused into the oil. And, oop, they're there. In with my veggies. Put just a bit of salt on these guys. It'll help a bit of the water to come out. Not too much because I've already got salt in the sauce. <laughs> I hear oh. that's how you're supposed to do it. Oh, a little bit of spice. Now, at this point, I don't want to overcook the veggies because I still need to add the chicken back in and I still need to get the sauce in and thick at that. I do want them wilted and it's okay if the veggies aren't like, like you can eat this stuff raw, right? So it doesn't need to be cooked, cooked. It needs to be heated through and a bit cooked and then it'll finish cooking with the rest of the stuff. be done like right when the live stream ends. <laughs> you have time for a question while you're working? Yeah. Uh, Iceman wants to know, how would you pick a cleaver if you have to buy it online so you won't waste money for nothing? And then we got into a little discussion about CCK and how good they are. Yeah. Uh, well, 
a cleaver is never a waste of money. So don't worry about that. And if it's not the right one, just buy more. But uh, yeah, picking a cleaver online can be a bit tricky. Uh, I did write a whole blog post about the different cleavers that we sell, the different weights, the different sizes, and the different purposes. Uh, so that would be a good resource for you. Also, I mean, you can give one of our stores a call and we can kind of like walk you through it, figure out what your needs are. Is this the how to use a Chinese cleaver guide? Uh, I can't remember what that one was called, Nathan. The one where I did kind of like a big comparison and it had like a rating system. Okay, I'm putting in the chat Colin's blog on how to choose a cleaver. I've also got like um, another video, like the first cleaver video I made was a uh, Chinese cleaver mega comparison. That, that's the one. That's all, the all one video. Yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. like there's a blog post which has like numbers and rating systems. There's like a video where I talk you through it and like demonstrate them all. Try and uh, put out lots of resources for people to make those kind of decisions. But you know, call one of our stores. We're happy to help you pick one. Todd says, Colin's using the walk spatula from hell. <laughs> oh! <laughs> All right. Cornstarch slurry in just to thicken up my sauce a bit. I wish I could live stream the smell to you guys. Mm. It is so good. Order a knife now and we'll uh, capture some of the steam in little jars and nails. <laughs> <laughs> Colin's gave her girl bath water. <laughs> oh yeah, she's looking good. Even just the color looks gorgeous. I wouldn't even put it in a bowl. We can go family right style right out of the walk. Right. Should I get the rice? Get the rice. All right, that's done. I am going to get my garnish on there. Woo! Making it rain. Green onions. Rice up. We got to put some sauce on our, salad. our cucumber salad. Yeah, thank you. How would you prevent a wok from rusting and having stains even though he wa washes and dries it immediately? Uh, if it's carbon steel, it's going to stain. Yep. That's just how it is. It's part uh, of the experience. Like with carbon steel, it does rust, but also if you build up a really good seasoning on it, it's not as likely to rust. Yeah, wonderful. And with the sauce yeah. for this, yeah. Uh, so. You know, make sure it's well seasoned. When I wash my carbon steel walks, I don't even really use soap. I would use like a Tawashi scrub brush, uh, like a, a coconut fiber scrub brush or like a bamboo scrub brush. Get all the food out of it and then put it back on the stove to dry. It'll still be like a, a bit oily. Uh, I might even, as it's drying on the stove, add a bit more oil and kind of re-season. So it's always got a coat of oil on it. Uh, definitely don't want to like wash it and drip dry it. That wouldn't be good. Oh yeah. That sauce is looking good. I think it benefited from just kind of sitting there for, for a bit. Let me get this over here. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Look at that. Little garnish. Food's up. And uh, as they say in Cantonese, hoi fan la. <laughs> what does that mean? It means uh, open rice. Uh -huh. <laughs> it means like food's ready. Oh, gotcha. 
Nathan's taking a picture. Camera eats first. Oh, my feet are in that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> for free? Yeah, no, you gotta pay for that. Cool. Well, uh, mm. it, I think it's time to serve this up. Yeah. We just uh, called our coworkers in from the warehouse. Yeah. If you've got any more questions for Colin, uh, we might hang out for a minute or two. So pop them in the in the comments here. <laughs> Lumative is. Uh, he says, spoon? Not using a cleaver to spread the sauce out? <laughs> I'm sorry, Lumative. <laughs> I have shamed myself and my family. I will oh, fall no. on my cleaver after this. You just buy a box of chef's presents? No. Put one of presents here. Empty stuff in it. You want to try some food there, Nolan? I actually have to go. Okay. But thank you. Sure. It smells amazing. No, I'm going camping. Oh, nice. I was about to be, uh, about to say. Uh, Iceman would like to know, um, if you make stir fry, is there a way to reheat it without the sauce drying out? Uh, I would say just like add a little bit of water, but it's always best fresh. It's always best fresh. Yeah. Uh, whenever I'm reheating anything in the microwave, first of all, use the reheat function if you have one, because the cook function will cook it faster, but then it's like cold in the middle and hot on the outside. So more like a little bit lower heat for a longer amount of time put a little bit of extra water in it and cover it with something. Like you can get a microwave sort of steamer covers. If you do all those things, it uh, doesn't dry it out as much. Also though, if you want to be Chinese about it, get your wok, put a trivet in it, get your bowl ready, put it in, water, lid, and steam it. That won't dry it out at all, but it will reheat it. Mm. Yep. So do you just put stuff right onto the rice? Yeah, I mean, um, like, you can take a little, you can take a lot, like one at a time. It's kind of up to you. Sweet. Yeah, just like how, however you like. There's no rules about eating. No, just like give her, basically. Why don't you just plate up a nice her. bowl, we can show it off, and then we can say our farewells. Our friend Jennifer says, this has been lovely, thank you. You're welcome, Jennifer. You're Thanks welcome. for hanging out. Yeah, we had a lot of fun doing this one. If you guys want to see more stuff like this, it's a little less knife-centric and a little more cooking-focused or that kind of thing, let us know. Yeah, give us a comment. Oop. You got the nice bowl there you want to... Yeah, I think this is pretty-ish. Good enough for the camera. <laughs> camera always eats first. Yep. We eat a lot of cold food around here. Yeah. <laughs> that steak we had on Friday was pretty good. Yeah, it was good. Uh, you can put that right on the cutting board where the mug is. There it is. There it is. Beautiful. Should we have a little reaction? <laughs> just, just to really torment the people at home? <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, let's see how I did here. I'm starting with the cucumber. Mm -hmm. Come get some food, Ellie. Or you just take some meals out of the fridge. Come eat. Take meals. I can just dive right into this chili, eh? Yeah, man. Mm. Open the potato salad's really good. Mm -hmm. I was a little confused about that one. Dr. Cleaver nails it, it again. It's different, right? It does mm -hmm. rice, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a devotee. <laughs> I have two <laughs> Instant Pots now. I know that like, you've got the fancy rice here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it's called, but... Those are your mm. tea. <laughs> the stir fry really turned out good. Mm. It's a little, like maybe a little too salty, but that goes so good with a lot of rice. Mm -hmm. A little bit of stir fry and a lot of rice. It'll work itself. All right, my friends, it has been lovely. Thank Ooh. you so much for joining us on this culinary adventure, and we're mm. going to go eat some delicious food now. All right, Goodbye. happy Friday. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank Goodbye. you. Watch Monday's video. Goodbye. Yeah, Monday. watch Monday's video. It's going to be really great. Mm -hmm. What's Monday's video? See ya. Fermenting and preserving pickling. Oh, is that the